Good afternoon. I think we'll go ahead and get started here, being on good university time, just a couple minutes after the hour. Thank you all for coming here this afternoon to the Atlas Speaker Series, made possible by a generous donation from uh, Edith Harrell Caperton and Annette Harrell. My name is Kathleen Archuleta. I have the pleasure of serving as Director of External Relations here at the Atlas Institute. We're coming to the end of our fall roster of Speaker Series visitors, which concludes with entrepreneur Wendy Lee on December 3rd at 6 p.m. So note that's a different time than our usual 4 p.m. Uh, here in this room, co-hosted by Silicon Flatirons and the National Center for Women in IT, housed here within Atlas. Uh, she'll be speaking about lessons and challenges of entrepreneurship. The new lineup of speakers for the spring semester will be available on the Atlas website soon, or you can add your name. There's a little series of things here on the table on your way out or in. Um, you can add your name to the spreadsheet there, your um, email address, and we'll be sure to send you um, reminders of both the speaker series events and also events in our black box theater downstairs, if you haven't seen that. Um, my friend Ira asked me to make an announcement about an upcoming free performance uh, this weekend here in the black box theater, Tame Your Man, um, Friday and Saturday at 7.30 p.m. More information about that is available on the Atlas website as well. And there is a little um, thing that both a reminder about Wendy's talk as well as about upcoming performances in the black box. There'll be two more this semester. I was smiling, so I think I did all right on that one. Um, this afternoon, Atlas is pleased to welcome Yasmin Cafe, speaking about her efforts to expand the culture of computing. A longtime researcher in technology and education, Yasmin uses digital design tools like Scratch and eCrafting Circles to creatively engage young people, particularly girls, in programming activities and learning communities. As many of you know, part of Atlas's mission is the exploration of how information and communication technologies are shaping society. We bring in distinguished visitors through this forum from academia, industry, and the arts, and other areas to discuss the opportunities and innovative applications of such technologies today. And perhaps nowhere are these efforts more important than in education today, and we're excited to hear about Dr. Cafe's work. Yasmin Cafe is Professor of Learning Sciences at the University of Pennsylvania. Her collaborations with MIT researchers have resulted in the development of Scratch, the largest and most, most popular youth programming community for creating and sharing games, animations, and stories. Yasmin's current projects examine creativity in the design of computational textiles with urban youth. These findings will be showcased in the upcoming book, Textile Messages, Dispatches from the World of Electronic Textiles and Education. We also welcome you to take information about K through 12 and computing education from NCWIT, which is over on the table. This also includes uh, case studies and references to Yasmin's work with Scratch. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Yasmin Cafe. Thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk. And I have a very generic title. Usually I work a little bit better on my title, as you will find out. But um, I, I created a new subtitle, Disruptive Designs, because we do talk a lot about disruptions. And what I want to do today is to think with you on how we actually can conceptualize kind of making technologies for girls, what the different directions should be. And I think one of the main questions is, I mean, do we need to design specific technologies for girls? And what I will do, I'll start first out with a little teaser and then kind of take you uh, through different ways on how to look at answers to those questions. Uh, also, I present to you uh, with a conclusion at the end, uh, but we'll kind of do some legwork through the history of people what have done in terms of creating uh, games for girls, uh, creating design opportunities, uh, and then re-examine the question again. So in order to start, uh, this is um, a little spoof from Saturday Night Live. It's called Chess for Girls. And I think... <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
So, whoops, this is uh, maybe not like uh, I envisioned. <laughs> we didn't need the wake up call right now. But I think you get the idea. I mean, we often talk about how can we broaden participation, and I know that the NC Witt Center here on campus, uh, this is one of their main missions, and it's also uh, a considerable large part of my research is dedicated to broadening participation of computing and to the question on how to do this, in particular since uh, the absence of women in underrepresented groups is so stark and hasn't changed over the last 20 years. Uh, so I think the question, do we need to design special technologies or games for girls, I mean, is a smaller subset but very much representative of the larger issues. What I want to do today is kind of just illustrate first some of the kind of shifting trends around girls and technologies over the last 20 years, because I think it's good to kind of have a larger framework perspective on where we are, and then to present to you two case studies uh, around girl games and girl uh, designers uh, to illustrate what kind of different perspectives are before coming to the conclusion. So um, this is something, you know, gender concerns 20 years ago, um, and this came out of a report uh, which I wrote together with a group for the American Association of University Women, who about 10 years earlier published a very well-known report on how schools shortchange girls, and Tech Savvy Girls was kind of the follow-up noticing that in science and math, I mean, some progress had been made, but technology was kind of still uh, on the bend, and so one of the observations was in looking at games, video games, computer games, which many consider to be the gateway into technology, because lo and behold, uh, at that time, and even, I mean, today, about 90% of all nine-year-old boys had a game console in their ground, so they had a lot of experience, and girls didn't. And, uh, you know, there were many explanations on why girls weren't interested in technology and games by extension. Many of them said they're just not interested in the first-person shooter and all the violence, the gender stereotyping. Then some of them said, well, you know, girls just aren't good at game playing, you know, and so why would you engage in something which you can't play very well? Um, there is, however, a lot of research which shows, I mean, if girls play long enough, they catch very easily up. So it is actually mostly an experience factor that girls don't become engaged uh, in gaming. I mean, this is, of course, just a smile of a really larger issue around women and technology. And my colleague Jane Margolis and Ellen Fisher have kind of written I mean, that very illustratively in their work, Unlocking the Clubhouse, about the technology culture in Carnegie Mellon and other places. I mean, there is a limited presence in the game industry at large and in technology. Uh, even though we see a few sprinklings, lo and behold, we don't have parity on this level. Uh, but I think this lack of presence also results in a lack of diversification and content which is created because not enough different voices are in participating in the design. Uh, and this has resulted, I mean, in general, a decrease of women um, and underrepresented groups in IT. And a persistent, I'm not going to show you the many slides of doom which we have about the lack of participation in AP exam, lack of enrollment and everything. Uh, I think those are very well known, but they present a larger picture for education and people like me who work mostly in the K-12 arena, because by now it's known if you don't start early enough, by the time you come to college, it is way too late to kind of catch up on the experiences. Um, and even today, when you look at gaming, uh, the field isn't, the questions aren't that different but there have been some changes. I mean, in gaming in particular has experienced a dramatic growth in some categories. Uh, and I usually don't like that we talk about casual games, but that's where many game players, many women are who are playing games. Um, not so much in many of the more traditional um, 
in games. Uh, and they point out now today that there actually is a lot of similarity. And I probably, if I would poll you here and many other people, everybody actually has a cell phone. Many people have smartphones, have game consoles and computers at home. So 20 years ago, when we talked about the disparities, it was really a disparity of access and participation. Nowadays, we don't have as much disparity in access, but we do still have disparity in participation. And these are just some of the latest numbers. Uh, while the general game players have increased in some categories, they actually represent the large majority. So gaming, at least on some level, isn't quite as much, I mean, the dismal situation as it was uh, 20 years ago. Uh, so how have people kind of dealt with this issue? So the girl game movement is actually uh, not just kind of one way of thinking of designing games for girls. There were several efforts. And the one probably many of you uh, remember or know uh, is the Barbie fashion designer. They're actually still available today. And I'm, I'm uh, actually to say it was a really interesting package. Uh, uh, even though it's Barbie, uh, you can't see this very well. So you would go into Barbie and you could actually design all the clothes and then with your software package would come special paper which had a kind of fabric-like feel and you could print out all the designs and then glue them together and make your own clothes for Barbie. And I know uh, 20 years ago this was actually quite unique to have this connection between screen and offline world. I mean, most of the stuff was just happening on the screen. Um, and this is actually something I'm coming back later when I talk about the electronic textiles, which really talk about making the design computationally accessible. Oh, and when you made Barbie's clothes, uh, they were, she would actually model the clothes for you, too, in a 3D catwalk of one minute. This was all running on 256K PC machines, so that was pretty nifty. But you can see this is a kind of traditional notion. At the same time as Barbie came out, a group led by Brenda Laurel, some of you might know, she came from Interval Research, said, well, you know, the girls I interviewed actually want to have different kind of games. So she created a company called Purple Moon, which you see there, and there's a whole series of games around Rocket, her first day at school, uh, secret garden and uh, everything where uh, you would kind of investigate different environments. Definitely different, I mean, from Barbie, uh, but still kind of very much grounded in a traditional world. And lo and behold, uh, a lot of people had quite some issues with these particular games for girls. I mean, very clearly, very traditional values, especially in the Barbie software, which spawned, I mean, I think 20 or 30 uh, different titles. The Barbie fashion designer is actually the most interesting one. I mean, so the other ones are not that, like, very limited choices on how, uh, you know, girls were portrayed, what their options were. And some of you might remember a few years ago when Barbie came out and say, I hate math or something. and. Uh, they're trying to kind of diversify. And some argued actually that this kind of creating these special games for girls would lead to a kind of ghettoization of girls, of kind of making them really uh, removed. And from a feminist perspective, uh, there was a lot of talk about essentializing on who girls are, whether it's Barbie or whether it's Rocket and Purple Moon. Uh, you would kind of stereotype what of, is expected of girls. And lo and behold, this kind of criticism was fueled by a lot of research coming out of uh, um, Judith Butler's work who said, girl, I mean, gender uh, isn't just a biological marker, it's actually a socially constructed entity, and we should think about gender as something which is performed and create opportunities for that. So, you know, you're a girl in very different ways when you hang out with your friends as when you interact, I mean, in a professional setting. Gender, you are not always the same. It depends on the social context. So a few people thought, um, you know, if we really want to kind of challenge stereotypes, we should make games which kind of go about this. And here is a game which Eric Zimmerman from 
the Institute of Play put together. It was called Sissy Fight 2000. Unfortunately, he had to take this down. And it would kind of emulate what goes on on a schoolyard. And you know, the biggest bully essentially would win. And it was kind of really kind of working with the stereotypes and bringing out everything uh, to the front. And I think that's a kind of very interesting concept uh, rather than to kind of fit within the stereotype to argue against. And then there are kind of games, what are called for expression. Uh, this was done by Mary Flanagan, who is a very well-known game education researcher. And she kind of created this modding game where actually you would kind of design all the different interactions, the looks and the perspectives, I mean, and the actions of, I mean, what was happening in the game. So you can see the diversity from, on one hand, completely uh, you know, defining on how you look and what you do, and to the other, where it's entirely in the role of the player to assume these responsibilities. So I think, you know, this wraps up about 10, 15 years. And if you look today at the software titles, you will actually find many of these uh, reflected. Uh, but it actually illustrates that there is one, more than one game to play for girls and to make. Uh, and that we could kind of shift between this perspective gender as different, girls as different from boys, to gender as performance, which kind of leads us to think about game design contexts which are uh, allow for expression and participation. Well, this is kind of your reading assignment. If you're interested in following up a few years ago, um, I pulled together an update on the first book which Justine Cassell and Henry Jenkins did from Barbie to Mortal Kombat, uh, talking about gender and games. So this one came out in 2009. Uh, and it's called Beyond Barbie and Mortal Kombat because uh, actually people still know what Mortal Kombat is and Barbie, of course. But it actually talks about a lot of what we know about girls as gamers, girls and women as gamers, about designs and women and the industry to kind of reflect the change in the field. So lo and behold, this kind of encapsulates what most of you find in the industry today in kind of designing technologies, designing applications for girls. And I showcased you that there's a variety of different ways to think about it if you're interested in making games for girls. How does this look when you look at uh, girls actually as game designers themselves? Um, I mean, the last example of making games for expression, of giving girls the tools of design into their hand to make their own games was actually a precursor to that. And nowadays, uh, we actually have a whole bunch of game design tools. Scratch is not just one of them. There's Kodu, there's Alice, uh, there's Game Maker, there's Game Star Mechanic. So we do actually have a lot of environments where novice beginning designers can create their own games. And I, you heard in the introduction that about 10 years ago, Mitchell Resnick and I started thinking about how can we create a programming tool that is accessible to beginners, so it has low floors. Anybody can start, even if you have no programming experience. It has high ceilings, which means you can also make very sophisticated things if you want to. And it has wide walls. It allows for a variety of range of different activities to design. So Scratch was designed with this in spirit. It wasn't designed for schools. It was designed for the Computer Clubhouse, which is a community technology center network worldwide. There's about 70 of them uh, here in the United States. And uh, the Computer Clubhouse actually came in the early 90s from the Computer Museum. Uh, where kids kind of snuck in because they wanted to make things with technology, but they didn't have the opportunity to do so in their homes or in their schools. And so they created this after-school space, and then this funding from Intel, which kind of proliferated. Uh, one of the shocking things was uh, it was meant to foster creative uses of technology. So no homework, no typing, no network license. It was really kind of do creative things. Uh, no programming took place in the computer clubhouses. 
uh, uh, there was, however, a very vibrant Adobe Photoshop culture. Kids, I mean, were crazy about taking photos and putting themselves right next to rock stars and everything. And so Scratch was meant not to manipulate math and science, how many kind of had used programming before, but to manipulate media, to create animations, graphic, music, sound. And so what you see here uh, in the back is kind of your traditional program code, you know, the text. And in Scratch, as you can see, you actually don't type, you move blocks around. Uh, and the blocks are color-coded for their functionality. We do spend a lot of time thinking about where the blocks go. Uh, and then you move them in the middle section and they click together like with little mag magnets uh, to show that the blocks actually belong together. And that's very helpful for beginners who still, you know, do a lot of problems with typing. Here you don't do need to, lot, to do a lot of typing. And you create objects like those letters which are on the screen, which carry their commands around. And so actually in Scratch, you can do a lot and you can try this out. You can download it for free, your tax dollars at work. Um, you, you can do a lot of things. You don't need to do any programming. And many people are actually upset about this. But on the other hand, for some people who have never had any courses, who don't have parents or siblings who do it, it's a really nice way to get in. But then if you want to animate things or everything else, you do have to kind of get into the programming language. Um, and Scratch, as you can see here, we did this in a community center. Kids created tons of different games. So you can really see that this idea of kids making games is very popular. I mean, everybody actually, anybody who ever plays a game often says, you know, I really also want to know how to make this. Uh, and these are not just, I mean, your action-adventure games, even though they were very popular. You see all kinds of different types which were created uh, in Scratch. Uh, and again, if you're interested, which talks about these kind of after-school aspects, um, uh, there's a book where we pull together our experiences on working in an after-school setting and bringing computing there. But what I want to talk about in the context of game making is really the game making tools and communities. And many of you might know Minecraft, which kind of started a few years ago and which is extremely popular where people use these blocks and bricks to create worlds. Uh, there's also, I'm bringing this up since Edith Tarell, she was actually my, one of my advisors at MIT, has started Global Area Games. I mean, it's across many states an initiative where people program, not in Scratch, but in Flash and other languages, games and have competitions and share their games. Uh, and then there is the online Scratch community, which uh, we actually launched in 2007 uh, while we were finishing the design of Scratch. And this was the work of Andres Monre Hernandez as a thesis. And uh, we didn't have any advertisement. So from 2007 to now, we have about uh, 1 million members. Actually, every minute as I'm talking, a new project is uploaded. Uh, there's probably 2.5 million projects right now. Uh, on the site, and you can click on any project, uh, you can download the code, uh, and then you can put it up again and put your name under it. Actually, remixes are 43% of all the uh, projects there. Of course, if you put your name on it, the copycat police will come immediately and tell you, uh, because the system keeps track of if you acknowledge and credit other designers. But it's a very vibrant place where People live comments of likes, what you could know in kind of social networking sites. And I think none of us would have ever imagined that, I mean, in our lifetime, I mean, when we think about programming communities, that it would have such a success in creating a community worldwide. I think Scratch has now been translated in over 25 languages, where kids would come and on their own volition program. You know, kids do this in school, but mostly at home in after-school places. Uh, the way girls come in, they're actually not, they're about 37% of the users. So we don't have kind of parity, but a fairly large number. They don't do exactly the same things. 
And what we did, uh, we looked at a number of kind of scratch communities. Rika Rose Rock did this. Um, and uh, when they kind of started, so this is all fairly recent. Uh, and you will find they actually create an incredible number of projects. I mean, 290 projects, 391, 1,901 projects. And how many comments there left? 564,000. This is, I mean, immense. I mean, we're not talking about, you know, a little thing here right and left. Uh, and also, how many kids are involved in these communities? We took a closer look at the Warriors of the Sky. Uh, some of you here in your audience might know the books, well, maybe not, of Aaron Hunter. Um, it's a very popular series in young adults. Um, and it's actually written by a collective of women. Erin Hunter isn't one person. She is three or four women who write together these books. Uh, and they're different cat clans. And each book is about 240 pages. And around page 200, some one of the cats dies. I mean, it's always the, you can tell I've read some of those. Um, um, I've read so many of them that Amazon is now sending me recommendations for young adult <laughs> literature. So I know I have to kind of change my features. So, you know, it was actually very interesting. So on one hand, you know, you have extensive participation, as you can see here, in, in, you know, in a programming community. Um, and this is a map of the place uh, where uh, the warriors of the sky take place, the different clans are. Actually, one of the kids has drawn that. This is how it looks online. And kids, what they do, they create role-playing games. They actually don't program much. They create all the graphics, like the one you can see there. And then they use a comment function uh, to actively engage real time in acting out all the kind of struggles, debates, and fights these different clans have among uh, each other. Uh, and they create, essentially, their own versions, their own remixes of the warrior site. Um, so this was kind of troublesome. I mean, so here we have an area which is actually heavily, entirely dominated by girls. Uh, and they're on a programming site, which is great, but they don't do a lot of programming. They kind of found, in a very ingenious way, their way around of using the system uh, to make something which is of relevance. Um, just to kind of give you uh, some sense of kind of the comments of what is going on. There's also a lot of talk about everyday life which comes in. And I bring this up because, you know, in my first part, I talked about, OK, we need to kind of make games for girls in order to get them into computing. Then here, we have the second case studies. OK, maybe making games is not uh, uh, that good because we limit girls and we kind of always define, how about if we have girls make their own games? And so they can go into Scratch. It's freely available. Uh, and they do that very actively, but they don't engage, I mean, in the way we think. Maybe we need to kind of think in a yet different way of how girls as game designers or girls can kind of become involved in computing. So, you know, they are going to the scratch side, so it's not that they're not there, 37%. Uh, they game in their own genres, and that's probably something not so surprising because I told you before that girls and women are found in particular categories of gaming. Uh, but it's very participatory but less technical. So um, this is why, I mean, the idea of disruptive designs is maybe we don't use the existing clubhouses like when Jane Margolis and Alan Fisher wrote about unlocking the clubhouse, they talked about the unlocking the clubhouse of computer science as it is right now. Maybe we need to build new computer clubhouses for girls to kind of come in. And this is where the work with electronic textiles come in. Just as a reference point, I put up the Barbie fashion designer here. And then on the right side, you can see the lily pad Arduino which was actually created by uh, Boulder's very own Leah Beakley, who worked in Mike Eisenberg's craft technology lab. Uh, and the Lillipad Arduino is essentially the same thing as an Arduino, except it's kind of customized to work with soft materials. So you have the board, and then you have different sensors and actuators. You have an energy source, a battery. And you use conductive thread uh, to stitch circuits. 
um, and then put them onto clothing, and you can also aesthetically improve them. So what you're doing, you're bringing together two different groups. You have, I mean, the uh, traditionally male engineering uh, com and computer science, and then you have the traditionally female domestic kind of more of crafts and sewing. And that is, I mean, by definition, a very kind of interesting contrast, which I would argue is kind of disruptive to how not just we as educators, but also people think about, I mean, technologies, because those two, actually the high and low, shouldn't really go uh, together. Uh, I just want to show you a few examples. Uh, we don't have time to, maybe we do have time to run the video. We'll see. Uh, of some of the projects which people actually have created with the Lilipad Arduino, and you can see all kinds of textiles, different installations. Uh, um, all of this is kind of found on the web. And Leah was actually curious uh, uh, to see who is using the Lilipad Arduino, so she engaged Mechanical Turk to go out on the web and look who's making those Lilipad Arduino projects which you just saw a moment ago. And there are hundreds of them. And what she found is, not surprising, the Lilipad, the large majority of designers actually happen to be female. Whereas if you look in the Arduino area, uh, which is this little piece, it's functionally exactly equivalent to the Lilipad Arduino. So it's just packaged differently. Uh, you will find that the large majority, 86% of the designers are male. And so this is a really kind of interesting observation. You know, it's te technologically exactly the same thing, but because it's grounded in a different community and culture and suggests kind of different activities, it brings in different groups of people who usually probably we could say wouldn't have worked with the Arduino, even though they probably could have done many of the same projects, but they chose the Lilipad Arduino. Because obviously, you know, the way the Lilipad is designed was creating hookups for uh, thread and with its focus on aesthetic, appeal to different aspect. So if you think about it, the high-low tech of the e-textile makes visible cultural norms. And when we think about disruptive elements, I think um, it was a Harvard professor, Hans Christensen, who kind of coined the term of disruptive innovations. What we have here, rather than to hide what's going on with technology, we're making it explicitly visible. So that, I mean, you can actually see what the boundaries of computation are. Would you ever have thought that textiles and computing would go together? It doesn't seem so. And likewise, oops, uh, just to show you that this actually plays out in a high school class which we ran last year uh, in Philadelphia, we had equal number of boys and girls participate in electronic textiles. And this is just one of Luca's reflections uh, um, after the uh, course, he thought that sewing was actually a women's sport. <laughs> but, but I think what, what, what comes across here that even he realizes, I mean, where the kind of boundaries are and how, I mean, working with the electronic textiles, what usually is stereotyped as the one or other, kind of can get disruptive. Uh, and I think that's a kind of interesting pedagogical strategy for us to kind of think about how we bring people into computing. And um, you mentioned already there is a new book. Uh, it will be all in color because I think things about computing and technology also can look pretty. Yes, I know I'm not supposed to say that, but uh, it's, you know, why not make these appealing? Uh, and we have all these royalties from the Lilipad Arduino, which we can't use for our own... Uh, enjoyment, uh, so we decided to kind of dump it into the book production uh, and to make something which kind of showcases the educational application. It's actually finished, it goes into production in the next months and it should probably be out early next year. 
So making new tools which kind of create, allow for disruptive designs is one way to think about it. But one lesson I learned, it's not just the tools like Scratch, it's also the communities which are really important. And so what I'm working on right now, also with Leah's support, is to think about how can we create new communities around electronic textiles which don't mirror the kind of communities we have already established. And many of you are familiar with robotics competitions. I mean, they're very popular and uh, also very expensive, by the way, to attend, and not many kids can participate. Uh, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the competitions. I think for people who kind of participate, preparing the robots according to the design specif I mean, the challenge specification, uh, it's a really valuable learning experience and teams uh, and going there. But I think that sewing kind of uh, engenders a different kind of tradition. And what I'm reminded of is kind of sewing circles, quilting circles. Uh, and they have a kind of more collaborative uh, spirit where it isn't about one winner but finishing one project together, all together. So currently in Philadelphia, we're working on what's called e crafting circles. Um, I just got the funding from the National Science Foundation. Right now, when you go to ecrafting.org, uh, we have a call for making monsters and masks with electronic textiles. And so all over Philadelphia, uh, in different locations, in schools, in science museums, in, hack in hacker spaces like the Hactory, in community organizations, uh, we have everybody from age 8 to 60. Uh, let's see, yeah age 60 to participate in actually working with electronic textiles, informal, formal, uh, across ages. Um, and the idea is that from now on, every month we issue new challenges like the one here, where people then can join locally but are being supported globally by an online site. It's not quite up running. We just got the grant five weeks ago, so we have to kind of match up. And the idea is that you upload your final designs uh, so you can kind of share them with others who are also working on the similar call. And uh, then at the end, we'll have a voting about the most scary, the most techy, different categories. So we have multiple winners and hopefully the, because everybody is working under the same premises that kind of create some of the kind of community elements which have been so successful in making the Scratch community a vibrant place for sharing. So starting in January, we will have been working on chain reaction jackets and astronomy t-shirts because in April is science festival time, and I don't know whether Boulder or Denver as a science festival where we have a local gathering and hopefully will create the world's largest human e-textile circuit with the chain reaction jacket. And also when Derek Pitts holds the astronomy nights, will illuminate uh, the star configurations via electronic textiles. So we're again combining local activities but kind of creating community through support. So disruptive designs are really about challenging stereotypes we have and making them explicit rather than to hide them and maybe to ghettoize. And then they're also about combining old and new technologies. I think the electronic textiles are a really beautiful example on how uh, we can kind of combine and integrate them rather than to see them as worlds uh, apart. And this will kind of allow us to create new spaces and communities, or as Leah Beakley said, we can kind of create new clubhouses to broaden participation in computing. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we have some time for questions, so just open it up and I'll let Dr. Cafe uh, pick and choose. Okay. You know the first, go ahead. Um, well, you've shown very well of how to draw girls into a new world of computers with design games. But did you hear like that there was a dream and that you will get more in good IT girls, women out of that, maybe? Um, well, I don't know whether that's wishful 
I'm thinking, you know, I work in the K-12 arena, so I think when we talk about introducing new ideas, my expectation is not that everyone is going to end up to choose computer science for their field, but to, to make informed decision in what they want to kind of investigate, engage further in, and there needs to be a starting place, and it can't just be when you come to college. So we need to start earlier in elementary, middle school, showcasing the variety of different uh, activities that computing isn't just writing code, isn't just about making games. We have a rich set of different activities where computing takes place. Uh, and then you can make kind of decisions what you want to investigate further. I mean, we have another reality that technology is literally part of all aspects of our life, whether it's private or whether it's professional. My colleague, uh, Mark Gastal at Georgia Tech, actually says that the group of people who do programming and are not trained end users are much larger than those who kind of go to college and get a degree and then work on designing software. Many people are engaged in some form of customizing programming, whether it's spreadsheets or whether they work on CNC machines. So, I mean, having some background is actually essential. Nowadays, we talk a lot about kind of computational thinking. I mean, that being kind of the core. Uh, and that's something which isn't just limited to computer science. It's presence people in biology when they decoded uh, DNA. Uh, they used the shotgun algorithm, something they couldn't have done on their own. They needed the kind of technology in order to uh, optimize uh, the process. And so I think what you, you need to think about it as a part of kind of basic civic skills, like the three R's which used to be fine in the pre-technology arena, we need now some form of kind of uh, uh, computational uh, fluency or literacy, which isn't just about browsing the internet or knowing how to game. It's also having some ideas on how, how the technology is being built. And so the examples I showed you illustrate, you know, you make your game. I mean, it's probably never going to be sold. It's never going to turn into an app, but I think you get some instrumental insights into interface design, what's hard and what's easy. Uh, and so I think that it is an approach to get you there, but it's not the end point. Yeah? So would you say there is a way to make violent shooters except for a girl named Franklin? Oh, um, no, I think there's actually a lot of girls who like to play those too. I, I, I think they, they, have a, they have a room. I mean, and by the way, you know, let's just get the numbers clear. The violent games, I mean, the first person shooters, I think are just 8% of the market. The largest number of games are sold are family games, sports games, which are violent too, by the way. Uh, so I don't think we should make uh, first person shooter games. Uh, what do you want? Do you want to put them in women's clothes or you want to take their guns away? And, uh, I think they're a particular genre and, uh, that can exist, but I think we can create different types of games. Whether it's casual games, whether it's, and we should make it acceptable for everybody to play anything and not to be exclusive. So I, I don't actually believe that there are gender neutral games which are often suggested. I think, you know, we, we, uh, we have certain proclivities and uh, they need to find it, but there needs to be openness and space to express and perform them. Yes, Stephanie? You used the word modding a couple of times. Can you explain what that word means? Yes, it's actually something which, um, when we talk about game playing, uh, most people think people just go and play the game like in World of Warcraft, you know, they become a dwarf or an elf and then they go on a quest with all their friends and fight the monsters. Modding has been introduced where people can actually modify game elements. And many games nowadays, um, that didn't used to be the case 20 years ago, uh, you can create your own characters, you can create costumes, you can create your own levels. Game companies actually encourage it because it takes a long, long time to create a game. Uh, and once a new version comes out, it's usually once a year. So they're counting on gamers to contribute content to keep the game going, to mod the game. And that actually requires, I mean, 
depends uh, different levels of technical skills. Uh, and I, I would think, you know, uh, people like Jim G have talked about what video games can teach us about learning and literacy and how games are great learning environments because they require people to collaborate, they have some technical skills. I would actually say, yes, that's true, but the really interesting stuff doesn't happen when you play the game because you're busy to deal with these crazy interfaces and, you know, when the monster's coming at you. The interesting stuff happens when you do the modding, when people create the sheet sites uh, in the discussion forums, when you kind of take a step back and explain kind of what happens. Uh, that's actually where a lot of kind of technical competency is, is visible as well. You know, that's a really interesting question because I think you're, you're right. I mean, you know, I think we have to kind of distinguish a little bit because, because some aspects of fashion are obviously very male. When you're a designer, that's usually not feminine, but when you're kind of sewing, that's a kind of domestically associated activity. Uh, and there has been kind of some broadening going on. If you think about Project Runway and all of these shows, which kind of, you know, um, showcase what's involved in these professions. Um, I don't think people, these, these stereotypes are very deeply ingrained. And I showed you a moment ago this uh, quote, this interview with Lucas. So nowadays, when we bring electronic textiles to students, it's, it's not that the girls all know how to sew and the boys don't. That's not true. Nobody knows how to sew and to craft. <laughs> but, but for some reason, these these convictions are so strong. So I worked uh, two years ago with a group of, of middle school students. Uh, some boys were actually also doing it. And whenever somebody came by and uh, looked at what we were doing, I mean, the activity, of course, created a lot of interest. The boys were always saying, oh, we're doing circuits. I mean, for the world, they wouldn't have been caught in sewing, you know? And so I think we, we can't, I mean, we can't pre pretend, even with kind of designing new technologies, that we can kind of eradicate the old stereotypes. I mean, I think they're going to continue to exist. What we can do is kind of broaden, like in the field of science, it has become much more acceptable that women, or in medicine, I mean, that women go into the medical field. Uh, likewise, if we have more activities, it will become more acceptable that women are gamer. We do have professional uh, gamers who are women, I mean, uh, who, who participate in, in game competitions uh, like others. They're still the exception of the rule, but they definitely showcase that the perception on who can game and who is good at gaming is changing. You know, a really important distinction, I mean, because in technology and computer science, we have for the longest part just focused on designing tools, on making them just perfect and supportive of novice designers. And I think we have actually made great strides. I mean, it's not just Mike Eisenberg, Alice Reppening with agent sheets here at the university. There are many examples which showcase on how to make good tools for beginners. But I think, lo and behold, these tools don't exist in isolation. They're always part of, I mean, a social process. They're there to be used and to create something which is of relevance in, in the community. So, I mean, for me, the breakthrough has been with kind of the Scratch community. We always had programming communities in classrooms. I mean, whenever we ran projects, whether you ran a college class, I mean, it always becomes like a kind of community 
on its own. What the online component has kind of facilitated is to create affinity spaces. So people who, you know, if you are interested in electronic textiles and live in a small village, you might not have anybody else who's doing it. But now you have an opportunity to reach out and meet other people who are interested in going through sites like, you know, Instructables or other places to find like-minded people to share your interest and further their development. And I think Howard Reingold's own work, I mean, initially was uh, well kind of showcased, I mean, what kind of connections establish. I mean, one of the challenges we have in education is uh, with a community like Scratch, with, I mean, a community like World of Warcraft, 10 million people. So Scratch has 1 million, World of Warcraft, 10 million. A Harbor Hotel, Virtual World for Tweens, you don't know it, 256 million avatars have been created. Very large community. So, you know, if we have these communities, the question is, does everybody participate? Does everybody collaborate? Because if we're interested in broadening participation and access, it can't just be a few people. And that's actually what turns out to be the case. If you look behind the curtain, the user data, in Scratch, about 5 to 10% of the users are the one which create 90% of the activity. World of Warcraft, same story. 5% of the players are really the one who run all the action. Uh, Hubble Hotel is a commercial private company. We don't get access. I work in a virtual world, Wival.net, has only 5.6 million tweens used. Same participation profile. So when we think about community, I think we have an assumption everybody participates, and that's just not, I mean, true. We have great stratification on who is doing, engaging in those activities which we find meaningful. And from an educational perspective, when we work especially in schools or he, even here in places like here, that's actually not something which is acceptable. We really would like to have more equitable participation. And we do know very little on how to kind of engineer these kind of participation. What the Yokai Bankler, um, who has kind of written extensively about, you know, what motivates people to participate in things like uh, enterprises like uh, Linux or Wikipedia, since they don't get monetary uh, compensations for their participation, what are the levers of engagement that get people to participate and reap the benefits of having access to a large resource? I, I would like to know more about this. Very interesting. I, you know, it, it's actually not that easy to join these communities. We have observed this in Scratch when you're a complete newbie. I mean, um, I have observed this when I started working in Weibo. You know, I'm a middle-aged woman. I mean, there are all 10 to 12-year-olds populating the screen. And I'm coming there, and the first thing somebody whispers to me, you are ugly. You know, I first close down the brow. I'm thinking, okay, you know. But I... I <laughs> It, it, it had a real visceral effect, and you know, it would have shut me probably out unless I had a research project to do, and so I had to go back in and face. I mean, you know, um, actually, you don't remember who said that, otherwise, um, I. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 it kind of made it clear, uh, you know, once you're part of a community, it's much harder to imagine what that's like when you enter these online spaces, when you look at the screen. How do you navigate? How do you know what to do? I have one recommendation to you. You go to cheat sites because there are some people who are insiders uh, will kind of give you a guide through and tell you what all the important things are. This was my survival guide uh, in Vival on how to kind of face uh, uh, the proving looks uh, of all my 12-year-old peers. <laughs> yes? So 
Um, with Scratch, uh, we, we just actually, as of the, I mean, in this very moment, uh, we, we collected uh, three months of back-end data since, you know, it's a research project and I have access uh, to the owners of the site. And we looked, uh, we collected 5,000, a random sample of 5,000 active users. And it turns out, uh, very much to our surprise, that not just the commenting and friending and everything, that putting up a project is your best way of kind of participating and coming back to